In 1972, when we uh, developed and published our first book, as far as we could tell, for the globe, for the global society, there were still two possible future paths, which we might loosely call overshoot and uh, sustainable development. And at that time, it was possible to imagine following either path. But to follow sustainable development path would require some major changes. We are today the product of many habits about economic growth, governance, our habits vis-a-vis -vis the environment, our habits vis-a-vis -vis energy use, and so forth. Those habits were very successful in the past, uh, but now we need to change them. So, I ask everyone in this room, please cross your arms. Now, look down and see which wrist is on the top. And just remember that, okay? I give you a hint, it's either the left or the right. <laughs> Everybody finds a habit, and it works, and then you quit thinking about it. That's like our habits related to economic growth and, and so forth. But sometimes the conditions change and you need a new habit. So I'm going to give you practice. Cross your arms the other way. So this very simple experiment shows three things which I hope you will remember while you're watching this speech tonight. Doing something new requires thinking and experimentation and the ability to make mistakes and keep trying. That's the first thing. The second thing. It's not very comfortable at first. And then the third thing, very important, it was possible. Most of you were able actually to do it in a different way. And I hope at the end of the evening, most of you will be able to think about sustainable development. We can realistically understand our options and start doing things now to bring us back down. Or we can keep pretending that we don't have to, and then we'll still come down, but it will be through forces that we don't pick. You know, it's like a car driving fast inside a factory building. It's gonna stop one way or another, either because the person puts on the brakes or because it runs into the wall, but one way or the other, a car is not going to go past the limits, and neither are we. You know, it's, it's this question, how do you get your conclusions about the world, about what's happening, what you need to do, and so forth? So there's sort of generally two ways to get conclusions. One way is that you decide what the important factors are, then you gather data about the factors to see what they're doing, and then you look at that and you decide what conclusions are justified. And if the data or the factors change for some reason, often you will have to change your conclusions. Some people do it the opposite way. They decide what conclusions they like, then they look around for the factors that will justify those conclusions. And then they find some data which somehow legitimate those factors. For those people, if the factors or the data change, they don't change their conclusions. They just change their data and their factors. This is the way I understand the current debate between the so-called climate scientists and the climate skeptics. But I no longer see any possibility of preserving you know, more or less the current uh, situation. Take, take climate change, for example. If we're not already there, we're very close to the point where the intrinsic endogenous feedback loops in the climate system have taken control, and it doesn't make any difference anymore what we do with Kyoto. We care a lot about climate change. Climate change doesn't care anything about us. 
Technology is not autonomous. It's not something that sits off in a room and sort of works on global problems and then when it's solved, one of them comes, you know, pushes it out the door. No. Uh, technology comes out of research efforts. Big, long, multi-person, expensive research efforts. And who's providing the money for those? People who are worried about global problems? or people who are trying to use technology to satisfy their own goals. I'll give you a hint. In the United States, we spend more money, the pharmaceutical industry spends more money developing new drugs to grow hair on bald heads than it does to solve the HIV epidemic. Why? Bald people tend to be rich, so if you can get something for them, they'll pay high prices. HIV people tend to be poor, so if you do develop something for them, you're going to have to give it away. So more money is going into this. Most of the technology development money that's the, the biggest share in the United States is spent by the military. They're not trying to solve global problems. They're trying to in, develop innovative new ways of projecting force and reducing the cost of their force mechanisms and innovative ways of killing people. I mean, population growth is important at the globe global level, but not in the way that many people think. A hundred million new Indian agricultural peasants actually have much less impact on climate or energy use or water, well, let's, global, let's say global air pollution, than uh, a couple hundred rich Americans. You know, so it's not the absolute numbers of the people that's, that's at issue here, but rather the total amount of energy and resources which are being mustered and, and pushed through the system. We need to start thinking how to take action. And of course, I have found another game to illustrate something about that. If you don't remember anything else I said tonight, I hope you remember the main point uh, of this exercise. In just a moment, I'm going to ask all of you in the room to clap your hands. Let me say, this is not a sneaky way to get applause. <laughs> this has a serious purpose. I'll make it very simple for you. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Then I'll say, clap. Don't, don't do it. And exactly when I say th that word, everybody will do it. And if we're successful, you know, somebody outside will just hear one very loud, quick noise. So I'm going to count to three. Then I'll say clap, and exactly when I say clap, you all do it. And then we'll see. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, clap. <laughs> this makes a very very important point related to sustainability. <laughs> Actions are much more important than words. So, you know, you come to this seminar and then you go out of here talking with all these fancy words, but if your actions are exactly the same as they were before, it won't make any difference. Thank you. Libby, you're coming from Australia. What about sustainability uh, in Australia and the politics for it? The question of sustainability in Australia, of course, is, is quite difficult. We have a very old country. Uh, it's uh, very flat. It's very eroded. It's very damaged by agriculture. And we had a simultaneous industrial revolution and agricultural revolution 200 years ago. So we had people living in the continent 60,000 years so much longer than Europe, in fact, uh, but European-style Western thinking just 200 years. But if we give up hope, then we won't be doing anything. So we must work out ways to maintain hope, and that is to shift the focus from carbon levels to society, I think. Jane, you're coming from South Africa. Africa is a big continent and uh, there are so many problems with pollution and everything. Um, do you have any impact on what's going on there? 
Well, look, I can't speak for a continent, continent that is uh, so diverse that it's very difficult to make generalizations. I mean, South Africa is a highly industrialized country and many parts of Africa are not. So, you know, for us, it's about clean air. It's about um, factories that are sustainable. It's about jobs for people. It's about sort of proper jobs too, you know, sort of not just... Um, hawkers at the side of the road. So I think that it is a very difficult thing to do to deal with as a continent. But I do think that as the most beautiful continent, with I mean amazing diversity of wildlife and so on, we maybe have a huge responsibility as Africans to keep some of it sustainable in that way and not lose all our biodiversity. Dennis, in what part of the world do you think change is starting now? I mentioned in my speech there's two kinds of problems, universal problems and global problems. The global problems are affecting everybody. Uh, climate change is, is manifesting everywhere, more extremely in the north, deep north and deep south, in the Arctic and Antarctic. But ice is melting, temperatures rising, oceans coming up everywhere. Uh, on the universal problems like uh, air pollution, uh, groundwater depletion and so forth, in many places, but in some, for China, for example, it's especially severe. Uh, in China, they have desperate problems with water scarcity. Other parts of the world, not so bad yet. Uh, do you think that uh, German politics uh, is sustainable? Well, I, I guess the question is, is the way that political decisions are being made now going to take our society in a sustainable direction? No, I mean, that's clear. I, um, I mean, for example, uh, nobody, not Germany, not United States, not Russia, are dealing with climate change. That's not sustainable. So if political leaders keep doing things which permit the CO2 to keep going up, that's going to produce enormous uh, consequences. Great idea, thank you so much, Dennis.